Hansen? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Randall? And Councillor Straw? Here. Thank you. Would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any uh, reports or correspondence that any councillors wish to give? Councillor Jordan? Um, I do. I just want to, um, I don't know if other people have been noticing this, but I just want to give a, a shout out to Chief Fenton because um, I've noticed so many of his uh, outreach to the community that really gets the, uh, the officers out of the cruisers and connected with people. And um, I saw uh, one of the events they did at the school with kind of a... Uh, a mock crime scene and the uh, sea salt and cops uh, meet up that's going to be happening and I just think we need to recognize that uh, approach to uh, police work in our town so thank you Paul Fenton. Thank you and I concur. Uh, any other reports or correspondence from anybody? Seeing none we'll move on to the finance committee report Councilor Straff. So you should all have in your packet the appropriation control, the revenue control, the revenue distribution, and the expense di distribution. And uh, we all should have uh, received this evening a copy of the financial dashboard. I had asked uh, Matt to uh, update the undecided fund balances on the bottom to reflect the most recent year. So it uh, kind of spells out the trend we've had of the rising unassigned fund balance. Um, that we'll be dealing with when we get to the actual budget. So as Matt will be covering uh, in the very near future here, uh, you all have your budget binders as well. Uh, we will be having our initial workshop starting next week as we work through the municipal, municipal budget. Uh, otherwise, myself and um, Councillor Garvin have uh, been in communication with the school board and working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with them to uh, help bring both of the budgets together and look for where we can find uh, some potential uh, one-town concept benefits, um, which we'll be talking about as part of that budget review process. Uh, does anyone have any questions on any of that? With that, I turn it back to Good. Councilor Graffin. Anything you wanted to add, Matt, before you can have your manager report shortly? Uh, no, sir. I, okay. uh, I'll, I'll be speaking a, a bit on, on many of those subjects okay. uh, shortly. Thank you Great. for your opportunity. Um, <clears throat> seeing no other questions for Chris, uh, is there anybody here in the public that wishes to speak something that's not on our agenda tonight? Seeing none, we'll move to that monthly report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Councilor Straw had mentioned uh, this evening, I have delivered to the Town Council the fiscal year 2020 annual budget uh, for your review over the next couple of months uh, to work on. Uh, I'll give you a brief introduction for that this evening. Uh, That we're looking at right now is this this year's municipal budget for fiscal year 2020. This budget, as proposed, would add 19 cents to the tax rate or 4.1 percent increase to the municipal portion. This budget includes all ongoing municipal, department, and community services. The total combined municipal and community services budget last year was $12,779,601, and this budget proposes a, a budget of $13,628,355 uh, $628, for an increase of $848,754 in spending, or 6.6%. This is offset with revenue increase from other sources other than property taxes of $456,000, or 9.1%. The amount to be collected from property taxes is proposed to be $8,139,955, which is 5.1% more than last year. So the first question is why is spending due to increase by 6.6%? $646,801 of the increase relates to personnel expenses. It's 76% of the total increase in the budget. It includes a 2% average wage increase as well as expansion from two to four per diem fire personnel, improving the town's safety coverage. There was an increase in the operating cost at the recycling facility due to increases at Eco Main in their fees from $70 to $73 per ton on the tipping fees for household waste and a new fee this year for recycling fees at $35 per ton. 
There's also an increase in the legal budget due to the ongoing lawsuits. Personnel related costs in total are about 6.99 million or about 51% of the total annual budget. The budget contains also significant capital item purchases in line with planned capital improvement planning. There's a planned replacement of the Public Works Department's bucket loader at an estimated cost of $250,000. Phase three of the Scott Dyer Road reconstruction is planned to begin in the spring of 2020 and into the summer of 2020. Uh, that's why we need to budget for it this year at a cost of $650,000. And additional paving and drainage improvements at a planned cost of $300,000 estimate. We need uh, with the need of continuous coverage at the fire department, there's an anticipated expense of $75,000 to convert existing space at the town center fire station into two bedrooms. And the fire chief will be prepared to discuss this in his budget presentation. There's also an ex anticipated expenditure of $145,000 for emergency power generators to be installed at the Thomas Memorial Library and partial funding for a new generator at the middle school in Pond Cove in collaboration with the school department. Offsetting these increases in capital expense is the use of unassigned fund balance in the amount of $750,000 towards capital improvements. And it also continues the use of $375,000 against annual operating expenses. This will lower the current amount of unassigned, fund, unassigned funds, but will keep the overall level of unassigned funds properly in line with the current policy. Additional funding, carry, additional funding carry forwards from this current budget will also be used to offset the capital expense at $300,000. Finally, the Fort Williams Park Fund and Portland Headlight Fund will participate in funding at a capital expense of $160,000. Ultimately, with all the capital expenses, which I have listed in my manager's message in the budget, to be raised by taxes will be $717,800. Finally, revenues from sources other than property tax are projected to have a net increase of $456,393, and residents have been buying newer motor vehicles, and thus monthly collections have been improving. The budget projects 2.2 million in excise taxes, which is a $50,000 increase from the current year. One of the bright spots in the revenue budgets is community services revenues are strongly growing. Uh, this reflects our solid gains in their programming, such as youth programming, Cape Care, and an increase in Richard's pool fees, which is great to see after many years. Finally, in Governor Mills' estate budget, there's a forecast increase in revenue sharing, and revenues reflect a conservative estimated increase. One other area that is still open for discussion is Port William, Fort Williams pay and display parking fees, which is not currently included in the, uh, in the current revenues that we have forecast, as I felt it would be presumptuous for me to do that at this point in time before the council has decided where we would like to go. So once we do have that, I can also make those adjustments as we go forward. And uh, I think that is pretty much all I have to say about that, but uh, but it's a, no. I want to say thank you very much to to my department heads. They've done a great job putting these budgets together. Uh, we have done a, a total reconfigure of our capital planning, and I'll be providing a, a more substantial report as far as our next five years what we have planned going forward. Uh, that's also be to be in uh, combination with the uh, with a comprehensive plan as part of their uh, part of the long term planning for the town. And we also have included in our capital planning that will be coming forward with the school projected capital planning as well going forward. So the council and the town will have a more comprehensive picture as to where uh, what the long term capital needs of the town will be. Uh, that being said, there, there are two other areas that we'll be bringing up during the budget discussions over the next next couple months as far as different operational areas that we may look at with recommendations where the town may consider uh, some changes that will end up being uh, to a positive impact to the tax rate, meaning that they, there are some areas that we can find more efficiencies, but there's some policy questions that we'll be bringing forward over the uh, next, in next week's two different workshops on Wednesday and Thursday night relating to the budget. So uh, with that being said, I do wanna, th I wanna thank all of our department heads for all the hard work they've done and to bring this forward and get it together with us on time and uh, look forward to having discussions with the council as we go forward and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Matt? Chris? Uh, two questions, just so we can set the narrative right now. Um, let's say, so as you noted, we're uh, budgeting for a 2.5% uh, 
uh, local share from Augusta. If that was at 5%, uh, would it be fair to say that um, we would have had a net zero increase on the municipal side of the equation or close to it? Very close to it. And then also, um, if we factored in the any potential revenue from the pay and display trial run at Fort Williams, would it be fair to say we'd also be at close to a net zero um, on the municipal side as well? Yes, if uh, you know, based on the most recent forecast that we were looking at an estimate of three hundred thousand dollars in revenue from the pay and display uh, proposal that we received, I mean it's three hundred eighteen. I think was the number that they had, but if you use three hundred as the number, you'd look at roughly the, uh, a, a 1% net taxes or net uh, revenues and expenditures and then roughly a negative amount uh, if you were just looking at that on the net to the tax rate. So instead of an 18 cent increase, you'd be looking at maybe a one to two cent drop. Great. If you combine that with uh, basically doubling where we're at right now in revenue sharing if the state actually funded at the levels that they were, that they had traditionally, then we'd be looking at a substantial drop in the tax rate. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions for Matt? Since we're talking about this, I will just point out and remind the public that we have our um, annual town council budget workshop scheduled for Wednesday, March 20th, and Thursday, March 21st. Those are both at 7 p.m. and here at Town Hall, we'll be in the Jordan Conference Room for those. Um, also, the school board has their next upcoming budget meeting uh, the day prior to that on March 19th. That's at 6.30 um, p.m. And I'm just double checking the location on that. Uh, that'll be at the high school library and learning commons. So if you're following along with all of the current budget activity, uh, those are some of the key dates that are coming up um, in the near term. Uh, if there are no other questions for Matt, we'll go to review of the draft minutes from our February 11th meeting. Uh, if everybody's had a chance to review, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Jordan, any discussion? I have just a quick question. Sure. Um, we had two people come and do a presentation on raising the floor. What, what happens now? I mean, they took their time to come here. Did they present to the school board as well? Or where does, do we ever want to talk about it again? So uh, we absolutely do want to talk about it again. Um, Chris mentioned the meetings that he and I and the school board chair and the finance chair from the school board and Matt and the superintendent have been participating in. Um, they, they did not receive the same presentation we did. I pointed them to the video of our meeting to refer to it if they were interested. Um, at our last um, joint subcommittee meeting last week though, um, I did bring this up to them as something of interest. Um, it was among other topics that we discussed um, <clears throat> how to best engage um, our state senator and state representative on as well to see um, you know what um, what movement and, and uh, interest we could generate from them as well. I see one of those two people here tonight. Um, and it was really helpful. It was very beneficial. I think it was logical. It makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, and so uh, we also asked as part of that for Matt to reach back out to the town manager from Fayette, who was one of the two people that presented, yes. yep. um, as he has uh, an existing um, connection and uh, you know, open channel of communication with him. Um, so that's definitely something that we'll, awesome. I think, continue to Perfect. monitor and pursue and see what makes sense as far as next steps go. But Councilor Straw. Small uh, bit to add is uh, as of last week, I think we are still waiting for an LD or legislative document yes. number for the right. bill. Um, once we have that, then we can talk to our state rep and our state senator or otherwise, uh, otherwise take an action once we have something concrete to point okay. out. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions on the minutes themselves? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you very much. Our first item on the agenda is number 54-2019, request for plogging weeks. This is a request that came from the recycling committee. Um, they've been discussing it at some recent meetings. Um, is there anybody that wants to come forward to speak on this item before we discuss it? Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm Bruce Reyna. I live at 309 Fowler Road. Um, and I put the proposal to the recycling committee back in January. They had a vote on it in February. And it was a 5-0 uh, approval. 
So I want to thank the Recycling Committee for putting that forward and also thank the Council for uh, letting me speak tonight. So um, I'll give you just a little bit of background on what the plan involves. Uh, it's also in the document that the Recycling Committee uh, sent along to the, to the Town Council. Um, in terms of the formal proposal, what I'm suggesting is that the, that the town designate two weeks a year as official plugging weeks. This would be the week around birthday in April and the week around uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in October. Um, the idea is that we want community members to participate in the plugging activity to help to keep the roads, the trails, the beaches, the beautiful places that we all love and cherish in Cape uh, as clean as possible. Um, it's an opportunity to raise awareness about plugging. Uh, runners do it, a number of runners do it fairly regularly. I have two of my good friends here, Steve Lee and Bob Dunphy. Um, Steve is the, the president of the uh, main track club. He's not a Cape resident, but he's, uh, we do have a number of members uh, from the main track club uh, in, in Cape. Um, and also Bob Dunphy, who's the who's a Cape resident and, a, uh, and the uh, race director for the main marathon. Um, both of them know the value of plugging and uh, uh, in terms of its ability to um, not only not only integrate, not only uh, uh, get exercise, but also to improve the quality of the environment. Um, plugging is a Swedish word, it comes from plugge up, um, and it's a combination of plugge up and jogging, so it's this mashup, and it's really taken off in the last uh, half half uh, half a decade. Um, if you Google plugging, if you haven't already done so. Um, it's, uh, it's everywhere. So it's a fairly well understood, well recognized phenomenon and uh, it's something that runners and cyclists and uh, walkers and uh, trail, trail uh, users uh, I'm sure know about. Um, so before I presented to the recycling committee in January, I decided to go for a plug myself. I do it fairly regularly. Uh, I'm a runner and a triathlete. Um, so I went out on News Day. I lived down at the bottom, the other end of uh, Fowler. So I left my house, went up to uh, uh, Barry Beach Road, took a left, and I, I jogged along the road to Crescent, Crescent uh, Beach uh, entrance, entrance to Crescent Beach. Um, it was about a mile and I plugged on both sides of the road on January the 1st. I collected 32 pounds of trash, including 54 redeemable bottles and cans, some pieces of star, uh, polystyrene, styrofoam, which is a, which is a known cut, <coughs> um, two windshield wipers, and a lot of paper, cardboard, and plastic. And uh, I sorted it, and then I took it to the uh, transfer station to get rid of it. Um, that's just one day. Uh, every time I go out, I, when, I, when I plug, I don't plug every run. When I do, I, uh, I, offer, I always fill up the bags that I take with me. Um, Zoe Evans, who's a, a Cape High School student, sophomore, uh, she is involved in creating a plugging program with the cross country team. Every Friday in cross country practice in the fall, Zoe would organize a plugging run for all the, all the uh, cross-country runners. I know because my daughter's are on the cross-country team. Um, Zoe's also trying to create a plugging phenomenon by having other cross-country teams integrate plugging into their own practice, their own, uh, their own training. Um, and she's attested to the fact that she plugs regularly and she attested to the fact that there's plenty of trash to pick up just about every time she goes out. Um, I think one of the most important things about plugging for Cape is our, our proximity to the ocean and the importance of keeping uh, uh, waste out of, out of streams and waterways. Uh, as you all know, 
ocean plastics is a significant issue. Um, plugging is an informal activity, so there's no need for an organized plugging event. But the idea for the plugging week is that runners and cyclists and walkers can go out at any point during that week and, uh, and collect trash as part of, the, part of the exercise. The idea would be for them to bring that trash to the transfer station. We would set up a, uh, a container, maybe a six yard uh, at, the, at the transfer station to collect the plugging waste. We would then sort it and then dispose of it in the, uh, at the, uh, in the dumpsters at the, tra at the uh, transfer station. Um, Measuring the waste, I think, is a key component. It was something that Carol Law on the Recycling Committee strongly recommended because it allows us to get information about what's being thrown away, why it's being thrown away, perhaps, and also communicate that to the community to try and get people to change their ways. Um, One important component of the plugging week is communication, as I, as I just mentioned, in terms of communicating the results to, um, to the uh, uh, local community. Um, it's also, we can also communicate it to, to bike clubs and runners through the Main Track Club and other, other organizations to get them to, to participate. Um, in terms of Formal communication, we do it through the courier, uh, signs at the transfer station, and also uh, signs at local, local businesses. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a, an avid, avid uh, athlete. Uh, I'm also the founder of a company called Athletes for Fit Planet. We work with uh, road races and, and triathlons and bike rides and other types of events around the country to help them to improve the standards of sustainability. So we work with the Boston Marathon, we work with the Houston Marathon, we work with the TV Beach to Beacon 10K. Bob, Steve and I just came from the, uh, from the first um, OC meeting, the Operations Committee meeting for, for the Beach to Beacon just now where Joni and Dave uh, McGilvery were, were there. Um, Beach to Beacon, as you probably know, is one of the most sustainable races in the country. It achieved uh, evergreen status as a sustainable event from the Council for Responsible Sport in 2016. It was the first race in the country to achieve that status, and we're going to be hoping to reapply for that status again this year. Um, I'm a concerned citizen. I'm an environmentalist to the core, and uh, any questions, I'm happy to take them. I think we have um, uh, some, at least one person I know who would like to say something. Is there any questions for me? First of all, thank you very much for that detailed overview. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Rayner, or are there others that would like to speak on this? Castro. So uh, the specific ask for us tonight is it that we designate the weeks of Earth Day and Columbus slash Indigenous People Day as plugging weeks on an ongoing basis? Correct. Right. If you want to adjust that a little bit, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, those, those two, I mean, it's a spring cleanup and it's a full spring cleanup. And aligning them with those two significant days. I think it's a nice uh, sentiment. Are there other questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Matt, I have a procedural question uh, um, to kind of follow up on Chris. Is there specific affirmative action that we need to do? I, I mean, I think it would, I, I like the idea and I'm supportive of it, but I, I just didn't know if there was actually specific action that's required of the council for this or is simply endorsing it? I think if you'd like to endorse it, that'd be, that'd be plenty fine and we can make sure, and to be honest, look, for us, just letting the recycling, uh, recycling yeah. center know that during those couple of weeks, uh, you might have a little bit more uh, recyclable material that would be coming in from very healthy people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is a good thing. Yep. 
staff there. Do you want to add comments? Yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Ann Carney. I live at 21 Angel Point Road. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the plogging program. Um, I think it's a really fabulous idea for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that I, I like to plog on Crescent Beach and Kettle Cove after a big storm mm -hmm. because the waves churn up a lot of trash. And it's amazing how much plastic waste golf balls and other things you find, clothing you find on the beach after a storm. And it really is a significant pollution problem. And so I just think it's a really great proposal um, from the perspective of cleaning up our beaches. The other reason I think it's really important is the potential for a program like this to raise consciousness both in our community and on a statewide basis. Um, I'm a state legislator for House District 30 and introduced this session a bill um, on polystyrene food service containers, um, prohibiting use of them in, in many instances similar to CAPE's ordinance. And at the hearing on that bill, there were still members of the Environmental and Natural Resources Committee who were denying that plastic waste is a problem here in Maine. And so I think the more we can do um, as a coastal community and as a group of people who really care about the environment, um, the, the more impactful efforts locally and statewide will be to deal with um, what is a really significant um, environmental issue in our state and in our world, actually. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, seeing none, is there anybody else that wanted to speak on this? Thank you. You're welcome. Seeing no other comment, I'll entertain a motion to endorse the proposal for uh, designation of plogging weeks in April and October. Uh, is there a motion? So Councilor Jordan, is there a second? <coughs> Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Councilor Randall? Um, I was just wondering, in terms of the timing, um, when are those dates when the recycling center has additional hours um, for like yard waste disposal and do those align with either of these because that would be a nice thing because I think isn't it open on like Sundays during this time period? Mostly during the, during the fall is when we have a lot of that uh, for a lot of yard waste in the fall is when we we'll do it. So we can it's generally around this time as well uh, is when we have that happen. So this would line up very well with that and uh, to be frank, also you know, around the Earth Day week is a really good time. We used to have a spring cleanup. Uh, that would take place for years, and then due to budgetary constraints, it was it was taken away years ago. Uh, but I think, you know, the conceptually it lines up great in the spring and in the fall. I think it'll be very close to, if not overlapping, at the same time period. So we should be in good shape. Yeah, I would add the other thing that's uh, it, where it aligns well with the spring is you've got um, if you had this in the last week or second to last week of April, then there's the e-waste collection day, e-waste and hazardous waste collection, and um, the uh, recycling committee and the transfer station usually do a shredding day too. So you've just got a kind of a nice sequence of um, things happening over probably about a six week period that um, thematically align to Councilor Devereaux. Since this is something that um, we're endorsing, will this be on our website? Can we put it on the website that these weeks are plogging weeks and advertise it to the residents that way? I'm sure we can coordinate that. Okay. Yeah, I think one other uh, thing that this might align nicely with, I wasn't able to check the dates, um, is the uh, Maine uh, Coast Week, uh, which is organized by the Maine Coastal Program, and it's usually right around this same time in October. Um, so perhaps we can make the connection to list this as an activity in Cape Elizabeth that aligns with that effort as well. Uh, I think that makes sense. I would probably turn those activities over to the Recycling Committee to coordinate. So, any other discussion? Matt, did you want to add something? If I may, Mr. Yeah, sure. Chairman. Uh, one thing that I've been working on with Wendy Derzewick, who's our uh, 
basically our, our communication wizard uh, who takes care of our website as well as uh, so many different areas of our communication is that we've been working and we may be pushing out either this week or next. Uh, we have a number of folks who have subscribed for email blasts from the town and we're looking on a monthly basis to be putting all the headlines that took place. I meant to say this but I, earlier in my report, but uh, I get caught up in budget areas, but we're looking on a monthly basis to take all the headlines that were on the CapeElizabeth.com website, consolidate them into like one, almost like a, in, in a sense a newsletter and push that out to anybody who would like to subscribe to that. So uh, anything along these lines, we'd have, this will probably be a story tomorrow. You know, as Wendy does a great job putting out every, all the actions of the council have taken place at the council meeting, summarizing it on the website and pushing it out as a story. But if we do that on a monthly basis, we'll have a couple of different prongs. We can share that information with folks in case they missed it on the website on one day, it'll be a headline that they'll receive. And if they're still interested, they can click on it and then access that info as a summary of the, the salient points that took place over the previous month. So we'll try to do that as well. Great. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? It's unanimous, thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate your time. Uh, next up is item number 55-2019, Coastal 10, uh, I'm sorry, Chapter 10 of the Coastal Waters and Harbor Ordinance Proposed Amendments. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing nobody, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Councillor Penny Jordan, Chair of the Ordinance Committee, to introduce this item. Okay. Um, basically, in um, October, the, um, the proposals from the uh, Harbor Committee uh, were moved to the Ordinance Committee to review things uh, such as some simple wording things within this ordinance as well as addressing the definition of houseboat and outhaul. I learned a lot about outhauls. I learned a ton about moorings and, um, and some other uh, wording issues as well. Um, and so basically what uh, we did and um, uh, was go through and look at the uh, chapter and identify those areas where we would uh, propose changes. And um, that is what we have in front of us this evening. Great, thank you very much. Um, So the action on this that we have um, for us tonight is to either refer this to an upcoming workshop, uh, refer it back to the Ordinance Committee for any reason, or to set a public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to make a motion? I, Councilor Jordan? I would make the motion that we move this forward to public hearing. I think that we, we did our due diligence as an ordinance committee. I think we uh, had some great input from uh, community members and I think this represents the uh, best foot forward for these items. So we have a motion to set a public hearing. I uh, presume that would be for the April 8th meeting yep. of the town council. Yep. Uh, is there a second? Councilor Randall, any discussion? Councilor Straw. Uh, I just had four minor grammatical changes. Should we do that now before it goes or deal with it after the, at the public hearing? Uh, either way works for me. Go ahead. If I, if I may through the chair, uh, yeah. thank you. Uh, Councilor Straw was kind enough to supply uh, his edits to, uh, to to myself and to Maureen and to Councilor Jordan today. Uh, Town Planner Maureen O'Meara has integrated his recommended uh, changes, so we'll have that language available and ready for the public hearing if, if you're comfortable with that. And specifically, it's just switching for which is to that. Um, Great, thank you very much. I see no issue with that. Jim, what did you say, sorry? Switching the word which to that. Oh. In four instances. For <laughs> grammatical purposes. Any other discussion? Councillor Gabrielson. Um, I just had a question um, whether there was any discussion. I, I, first of all, thank you. I, I um, think the committee did a great job looking through the ordinance and finding a number of places where um, you, could, you could use some modernization, so that's great. Um, and I also appreciate uh, the inclusion of uh, the design standards for outhauls as, uh, as part of the ordinance. Um, I was curious if there was any discussion about including design standards for moorings, other types of moorings within the ordinance as well. It's a common feature of a lot of harbor ordinances, and I just was curious if that had come up as part of the process. 
Uh, just Councilor to clarify, Jordan. you're asking if we wanted to put other mooring standards? Um, well, a lot of a lot of harbor ordinances include include design standards for moorings. Um, more typically in towns that have a little bit more crowded mooring field than we do. Mm -hmm. But I was just curious if that had come up, or or if it's something that the you know the ordinance committee thinks we should pay attention to or don't need to at this time. Right. In the ordinance, it's we have the the design standards are separate, mm -hmm. so that we don't have to change the ordinance every time we want to change the design standards. Okay. So. As you can, like, just in the last five years, some of the the issue, you know, standards have changed. So that would mean instead of just the harbor master making the change because the standard you know, is now elevated and we need a, a better standard, then it would have to go through a whole process of an ordinance change. So it's just easier to put the language in that the standard is set by the harbor master who we vet and employ, and then they set the standard. So that, it did come up, yeah. and that's why we did, did continue to it do it this way. way. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Randall? We also did have that in section 10 5 7, just like a very basic standard. But when the harbor master came in, he went over some of the standards he uses. He brought in, I think he brought in like visuals, um, and it seemed to be more helpful to defer that to him. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, the motion on the floor is to set this item to a public hearing for April 8th at 7 p.m. All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Ordinance Committee for your work on that and for the Harbors Committee uh, that originally brought that forward. Next item is number 56-2019. Uh, the finance director appointment. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Hi, Shannon O'Mara, um, 1890 Road. Um, I actually have a, a statement and then a, a question, if I could ask a question. First, the statement is thank you for <coughs> creating and, and, and uh, finding somebody for this position. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, the second, my, or my question is, can you give a little information on the responsibilities, like a job description, and maybe there's something out online, but specifically, what is the scope of the finance director's job? Is it just the town or the town and the school? And does he have um, authority, influence, final word in anything? Thank you. Yep. Um, thank you for your questions and your comment. Um, we have talked about this before, that very point, both in workshops and meetings, but happy to reiterate. Um, the position does report to the town manager, and so I'm going to uh, defer to Matt to um, give a description as he's sitting here. I know that we also do have an actual job description that I think has been posted as part of previous meeting materials uh, because we, pr we approved the job description at one point. Um, so we can we can certainly comb the meeting materials archive to pull that up for you too. But Matt, did you want to just sort of narratively um, answer? And I think specifically the question. Oh, there you go. Um, uh, Never mind. Narratively speak, though, to the the question, which I, I think a lot of other people have too, about the the separation of responsibilities between the municipal and school side of the house. Yeah. As Mr. Mara now has the job description in hand, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll forego uh, doing that full description for you. But we we do have that available at the archives at the at the council. But if, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to give me a call too. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, yes, this position is strictly on. On the town side on the finance uh, end of it. Uh, we, for years we have worked with the school as well, uh, but roughly what we found is over time both avenues have become larger. Uh, the reporting requirements are greater uh, as well as the level of inter level of work that needs to take place to, to do both positions. Uh, and we felt at this point we've grown to the size that we need to have the finance director for the town and the business manager would still stay on the school side. Uh, to be honest, a lot of the work that we've done on the finance side, I've done, and before me, Michael had done that, uh, and now to actually get it done properly is we just need another set of eyes and a person with the, with the skills and the and the abilities to understand what you know, we want to do it right, and I, and to ha and we've and I found a gentleman 
quite frankly, who's, who's right behind you a few rows back, uh, who meet, met all of those characteristics that we were looking for in, a, in the position uh, with multiple years of experience in, in, at, at the city environment, on the government lending environment, uh, at a small town environment. Uh, he checked all the boxes. So we're, we're very, extremely well, extremely gratified with our selection and it was a uni universal or unanimous decision of the, of the hiring committee as well through the process. So uh, that's, that's, that's why we're here this evening and have this here just to bring everybody up to date as well as uh, get to work. I hope that meets your, your questions. On, on the question of involvement of the school, the only thing I would add to that, and thank you for that, Matt, is um, you know, the charter and, and the organizational structure are pretty clear about, you know, reporting responsibility and roles and accountability and things like that. I think as we've talked a lot about in the last year and beyond, um, there's a desire to, um, on both the school board side and the town council side, to find efficiencies where we can, employ best practices where we can, um, come up with creative new ideas that, you know, where they didn't exist before. I think there's an expectation, even though the position reports to the town manager and won't specifically be doing any work for the schools, that's very clear. But I think, you know, with both um, operations existing here in the same office building, um, meetings like Chris and I are participating in, um, I think there's a hope and a desire that um, there will be a, a halo effect, if you will, um, that, that we reap the benefit of. So, um, anybody else want to add anything to that? Go ahead. Uh, one other area. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, we do. We will be sharing other staff members between the two departments. Like uh, we still have a payroll person, an accounts payable person. Uh, like, uh, you know, accounts payable, accounts receivable, and our uh, personnel slash uh, HR person uh, also will work. You know, we're still sharing those resources because we don't need to have two operations writing checks from the same building. Uh, so we still find those efficiencies. We just needed to, you know, find a little bit more specialized uh, professionalism. Plus, uh, we, yeah, as, as Chairman Garvin said, we will be collaborating with the school. I mean, it gives us another, another set of eyes and another person who can also help us maybe find better opportunities and solutions as we go forward. You're welcome. So we kind of have a two-step agenda process on this. The first item is to actually um, amend the personnel code um, to include the position, and then the second is to um, uh, confirm the appointment. So the first item is number 56-2019, like I said. So I'm looking for a motion to amend Chapter 3 of the personnel code to add the finance director position to Appendix A for the town of Cape Elizabeth salaried positions. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Randall, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. So secondly, item number 57-2019. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak again? <laughs> um, so uh, the town manager has uh, led a recruitment process for this. I'll turn it over to him to talk about the very qualified candidate that he just was referring to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, if, if you'd be so kind, I'd like to invite uh, John Cordero to come up to the to the podium over here, and that way you can get a good good look at him. <laughs> Luckily, uh, I, I did take a, a heroic leap today and asked him to have today be his first day, and uh, he's he stayed here uh, all the way through, and uh, he's planning on coming back tomorrow. So I. Say we've we've been successful hey, <laughs> to get things started. <laughs> Jumped him in this morning to both the personnel advisory committee meeting and our department head meeting. So he's had the opportunity to meet uh, all the department heads uh, who could attend this morning, and uh, we've shown him around the building, got, got him set up. Uh, but I'll give John the opportunity. He does a great, a better job than I do of describing uh, his expertise, and you get a chance to hear him. So, John, please. Oh my goodness! I didn't realize I was going to have to do this. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the town council, members of the public, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. My name is John Cordero. I was most recently the treasurer for the town of Gunkwood. I spent five years there. Unfortunately, if you pay attention to the newspapers, you will see that there are a lot of terrible things going on down there. And I must say, I was very pleased to be able to leave and come to a community that is much better run and is much more cohesive in moving forward. So thank you very much for that opportunity. In terms of background, uh, I've been doing this work for about 40 years. I've been a uh, 
a finance and uh, administrative director for the CAP agency. I've been a school business manager for a school district in Maine and New Hampshire. I've been a finance director for the cities of Saco and Bangor. I spent 15 years working on the banking side as a government banking officer and I had a territory from Maine down to Philadelphia. I worked with state governments in large state universities. Uh, I was also the CFO for Efficiency Maine in 2010 when they were separated from the PUC. I've done a lot of this stuff, a lot of things I've seen, the same sort of thing any number of times, so there isn't anything that I would expect to see that I haven't seen someplace else before. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with you, and I look forward to a long and successful time together. Thank you very much. Um, your credentials are quite impressive, and we're looking forward to a good relationship working with you as well, so thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for John? Great, thank you very much. Um, as was noted in the agenda um, for the balance of this year, the salary and benefits for this position will be funded through the unassigned fund balance, but will then transfer over to the administration and benefits accounts. Um, so at this point, I'm looking for a motion to confirm the town manager's appointment of John Cordoraro to serve as the first finance director of the town of Cape Elizabeth, effective March 11th, salary of $87,500 plus benefits, as I just said, will be paid from the unassigned fund balance through the remainder of this fiscal year. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, any discussion? Councilor Devereaux. I, I just have a question about the salary um, plus benefits to be paid through June 30th. So is that 87,000 going to be paid through June 30th or are you, uh, the way it's worded, it looks like 87,000 is going to be paid um, through June 30th. Um, uh, that, that, is that if, what's if happening? I, Please, yep. Uh, uh, yeah, Councilor Devereaux, great question. Uh, it, it would be prorated, so going forward, there would be the annual salary, but over you know, up until June 30th, so uh, it's approximately 40,000 salary plus benefits. Okay, so it is prorated, it's yeah. not the entire Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? That'd be a great job if I could get it for a couple months. <laughs> 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 Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion. <laughs> Passes unanimously, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, John, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Bright and early. He is coming back. Yeah. <laughs> Item number 58-2019, Statement of Policy Boards and Committees Barring the Appointment of Town Employees from Serving on Standing Boards and Committees Proposed Amendments. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, Councilor Straw, would you like to introduce this item? Uh, so a uh, town employee had previously asked that we revisit the policy on uh, board and committee appointments, um, questioning whether uh, it should be as broad as it was. And we had our initial workshop where we discussed uh, whether there was a consensus, and it seemed like there was a consensus about um, making the language a little tighter and more specific on the restrictions so that it uh, had a more rational basis to it um, and I, we now have language that came out of that process and I think it's now scheduled to go to another workshop is that the proposal yes uh, Councilor Devereaux I apologize I misidentified the chair of the appointment oh okay committee. I was like <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, I looked down this end of the table. I had Councilor Devereaux on my mind, and I just, Chris, your face just jumped out at me. And so, that's fine. No intentional oversight, and I appreciate the work that you and Matt did to craft this language, and I apologize. So. No, that's totally fine because um, Councilor Straw was the one who did bring it to our attention. Yes, but. Um, and um, Matt Sturgis and I worked on it, and as you can see, we added, um, we wanted to make it clear that it's. Cape residents only, and uh, unless anyone has any questions about it, do we need to workshop it again, or? I have questions. Oh, you do. But do we need a motion for it? Uh, we can either propose a motion to accept it and discuss then, propose a motion to refer it to a workshop. All those items are available to us. Do you want me to ask my question first and then we can make the decision? Sure. I don't know. Um, What's your question? Actually, I have several. Um, and I say this because the first one, only residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth um, 
only can serve on these committees. I will tell you uh, there's a history that that hasn't always held true. Um, we have uh, John Green who served as chair of the FOSP and I believe he was not a citizen of CAPE at the time but he represented one of the the knowledge of one of the largest landowners in Cape Elizabeth. And so I don't know if there's a way that we want to have on uh, appointments and you know the committees, et cetera, that there may be a uh, advisory member or something because those things can happen. Uh, the other thing is is that on FOSP there were members representing uh, several committees in town that uh, had land interests, whether it be SALT or Cape Farm Alliance or uh, I can't remember the other two. Uh, but uh, those committees are, are not necessarily town committees and so therefore have members that are not citizens of the town. So I just don't know how we want to play that. So I throw that question out. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that one now or the next question I had was on item three, which it's about an actual or perceived conflict of interest. Perception is a person's view. We have had experiences where some people may have a perception that a person who's uh, interested in being on uh, harbors committee or some other, you have too much of an interest and you're going to be biased towards certain things. And so perception to me is a, is a word that uh, creates a slippery slope. And so we may need to temper this uh, somehow. Um, and those were probably my two major questions. Okay. Um, I think given the questions, it probably makes sense to refer this to a workshop. So um, is there a motion to refer this to our March 18th workshop? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Second. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Next item is item number 59-2019, a vacancy on the Conservation Committee. Uh, with the appointments chair, Councilor, oh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this now? Uh, with the appointments chair, Councilor Devereaux, like to introduce this? Sure. Uh, we were told that Mark Fleming had resigned from the Conservation Committee due to scheduling conflicts. So the um, appointments committee met, we conducted interviews, and uh, we were all very impressed with Philip Saussier. He has impeccable credentials, and it was a unanimous decision. Is there Great, uh, would you like to make a motion to appoint Mr. Saussier? I'd like to make a motion that we appoint Mr. Saussier uh, to the conservation committee. Great. Is there a second? Councilor Straw, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you for your time and service, Mr. Saucier. Look forward to working with you on the Conservation Committee. He's already in there doing that. Great. <laughs> Get to it. Um, item number 60-2019 is the annual report on the property tax assistance program. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? There is not. Would the tax assessor come forward and give us a presentation, please? I'd like to apologize. I don't have my good singing voice. <laughs> covering from a cold. Uh, but yes, this is the first annual report on the uh, 2019 Senior Tax Relief Program that uh, the council approved in January. Um, uh, last fiscal year, we earmarked $75,000 for the program. And I'm pleased to announce that uh, through, oh, just earlier this week, we've approved 132 applicants. And of the $75,000, we have dispersed $64,407 to our, our seniors who applied. Uh, and that leaves us 
the remaining fund of $10,593 to roll into the, the 2020 fiscal year. Um, I only had to deny one application uh, and uh, that, that person, well, I won't get into it, but anyway. Um, and, and, I, and I really want to say that, uh, you know, I, I met all 132 of these applicants. They came into my office and what a, what a wonderful group of people. They, they were so appreciative of the program and they, uh, you know, they were very thankful and, uh, you know, I got some emails and I forwarded those on to the, the counselors, but uh, very nice. I made me feel really nice to, to be a part of the program. So I want to thank you all again for uh, helping get that underway. And I, I want to thank my office staff who uh, helped a lot of the people who came in and the, uh, the AP people who had to do a little extra work to get the checks done. But, you know, it was, it was all worth it. So hopefully next year's budget we can uh, see a minor you know increase in that pot because neighbors are talking to neighbors and it's it's going to become more popular so uh, any questions so that dovetails to what i wanted to ask two things is number one um are there things that you at this point would recommend as changes or e even if not changes to the program any sort of lessons learned that you can share um maybe simplifying the application a little bit um, and that's something that we can do on an administrative end. But really, um, you know, it, it had some moving parts, but I think all the parts worked really well. I didn't have to deny maybe a handful of people whose income was, was above 60000 um, And I think it worked really well. And those people who did get denied, I, I encouraged them. I said, well, you know, you might have been denied, but please... Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. They, they may be qualified for it, so they, they help spread the word. And also I want to thank the uh, Cape Elizabeth uh, South Portland Rotary Club. I went there and spoke, told them about the program, and they helped push the, the, the information out. So a shout out to the Rotary Club. The other question I had, you referenced the assistance from the accounts payable folks to push out the checks. Is there, and we may have discussed this previously and I just don't remember, but is there um, benefit or efficiency to, instead of issuing checks, have it be a credit on their tax statement or is that? Uh, I think we discussed that in the, uh, in the ordinance committee level. Okay. And it was determined that it's better off to to give them the check, they may have other struggles in their in their lives, medical bills or other things that they might need to address. So, as 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 difficult as it as it is administratively, it's probably worth it just to to get them the, the checks in their hand. Okay. Are there other questions, Councilor? Uh, two questions. The first. Um, Based on uh, inquiries you received and then actual applicants and whatnot, uh, just generally did you find or did you have the impression that the durational residency requirement we imposed of 10 years served as an impediment for applications or did you find it wasn't much of an issue? No, I didn't have to okay. deny, deny anyone um, for their 10-year residency. I, <laughs> I initially denied one. Uh, I said, oh, you've only been in your home for seven years and she called me back and said, um, yeah, but that house has been on leased land, and I've lived there for 35 years, Sonny. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you are approved. So, uh, but no, nobody else has Good. missed that window at all. So. all right. uh, and the second was um, uh, we didn't put any uh, asset threshold uh, in. Uh, so, is it your sense that that's anything we need to kind of keep an eye on or uh, be concerned about with people with let's just take an extreme number million dollar house valuations that are applying for the program? Nope, I don't okay. think so. Uh, I've got my data here in front of me and the, um, the average land and building valuation is $265,000. Right. So it really is 
you know. We're getting who we were targeting. Yeah, it's hitting the target real nice. Any other questions? Yes. Gaberson. Recognizing this is a very new program, I'm um, just curious if there were any patterns you noticed in when you were receiving applications, did they kind of come in all in one lump or have they sort of trickled in? And do you expect that to continue? Well, they kind of trickled in. Uh, then we got to the deadline and you know there were some lines at the counter. Um, and then once the checks went out, I had two or three come in and say, yeah, well, my neighbor got a check. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm eligible. So I, I kind of you know extended the deadline a little and, and and got them enrolled in the program as well. So, um, yeah. Um, mo moving forward, where we have biannual tax billing, would you see there being any value in having deadlines that align with those tax billing cycles, or is an annual deadline just more efficient from a the, staff perspective? Yeah, the annual deadline is better. What what we're going to do, and what I've told everyone who's applied for the the program is. You know, I've got you in my database now. So in the fall, probably around September, I'm going to mail all these people a new application. And then they'll have from September until probably the, the middle of November to, to get those applications back to me. Um, I could tabulate, approve them, and then get the report to the council by the uh, middle of December right before the, the budget season for you guys really begins. So that way you'll have that information. Um, and then we can also get the checks cut around the new year and get them into people's hands probably in February. So it's kind of a long process, but um, I think it's a good one. And, and having these people, it's, it's going to be easy for me to, to just send them an application. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Deborah? I, I realize that a lot of um, everyone's seniors, but still a lot of people are very um, computer savvy now. Is there a way that we could make it a fillable form like we do for the appointments committee to where some people could just fill it and it goes directly to you so you're not mailing back and forth? Would that make things um, easier? Not really, and really it's not too big of a, not too big of a burden. Uh, a lot of seniors really aren't computer savvy. You know, uh, a lot of us might be, but a lot of them are not. Uh, I think I only mailed out maybe less than five applications. Most people either came into the office and got it when they came into town, or uh, a few of them would download them off the website and, and bring them in. So. But you just told us that you're going to mail them to, to yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, all the yeah. Well, that'll be a you know one time to get the applicants out there. So I, I just think it's more efficient sending them all out at once. All right, just something to think about is because those fillable forms that we have for appointments are really nice. Mm -hmm. Something to consider. Matt, would you like to add something? If I may, Mr. Chairman, thank you. There's also verification of the information that uh, the assessor needs to do as, as far as income information as well. They, he does that at a personal level. They could fill it out you know, at, at home, but they, they, they still need to bring that in so so Clint can verify uh, that they qualify and then they, they can almost get approved right on the spot. So they almost, they know right there and then, but that's the only challenge. And they don't, you know, we don't want them to be sending something insecurely uh, to the town. That way they can bring it in, show it, turn around, take it right back out with them. Mm -hmm. uh, that way it's more secure and there's no opportunity for any of their personal information to be, you know, be right. lost yeah. or, or. And speaking of confidentiality, what I've what I've done is every application I've taken in, I've given them a unique uh, ID number. So uh, any reports that go to the council is just going to have this unique ID number. And then the information, no address, no map and lot. You know, it's I'm, I'm the only one who knows who these account numbers belong to. So, and I keep all those in a, in a folder. Ooh, where? If we get audited, I can give them to the auditors, but they are confidential, so no one's going to take them anywhere. So, great. great. Any other questions for Clint? Thank you. Seeing none, uh, is there a motion? Um, 
uh, with our uh, thanks and appreciation to acknowledge the report from the tax assessor. So moved. Council Gabrielson, is there a second? Second. Council Jordan, Council Benny Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Great. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the work on the program, Clint. Last is item number 61-2019, uh, our continued uh, evaluation, continued work on the evaluation of the town manager, annual evaluation. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, we need a motion uh, per the recommended motion here in the agenda to move into executive session. Could I have somebody please recite that? Councilor Straw. I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council enter into executive session in conformance with one MRS section four. 5 subsection 6 subsection A to continue the annual evalu evaluation of the town manager. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Councillor Devereaux, any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Great. Um, we will adjourn into executive session. Um, we will not be returning to public um, comment, so uh, unless there's anybody from the public at the conclusion of our, gen uh, of our executive session who wishes to comment on something, but there's nobody here, so I'm guessing there won't be. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much.